Love is the end result of being in God's workshop. It is faith that keeps us in the workshop. So how we become mature. Now, the Bible addresses the matter of the miracle of growth. And, and just to say up front that the spiritual growth is a miracle. Just like when the farmer plants a seed, he nurtures a crop, he doesn't know how it grows. It is God who gives life to that seed. It's the same thing with us. Spiritual growth, spiritual birth is a miracle and spiritual growth is a miracle as well. So how we become mature? The Bible instructs us to grow in grace. Um, three places there. Um, first Peter talk about the, the, the new believers who need to grow. And in chapter 3, you talk about grow in grace. So somebody instruct you to grow. <laughs> you know, um, How do you grow when somebody tell you to grow? Well, Jesus have the answer there. In John chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. He says, abide in me because I am your source of life and sustenance. Because you can't grow. You, can, you know, somebody can tell you to pick up a stick. They can tell you to carry some water. But when they tell you to grow, how do you do that? You abide in Christ and let him do the work in you and don't let go. We told you how to abide. We told you that love is the result of being in God's workshop. We told you that faith holds on to God and your understanding keeps giving you a reason why you should keep holding on. And once you do that, um, you will grow. Then there are, in terms of the farmer, in nurturing his crop, there are some very important elements that need to be in place for growth to take place. And you need to be aware of that. And that's what I'll be sharing with you um, just now. Quickly, um, we grow by the word of God. We grow through the power of the Holy Spirit. We grow through prayer. We grow through trials and temptations. We grow through witnessing and fellowship. I'm going to try to run through them quickly. I don't have um, the time won't be there to, to cover all of them. So let me just run through them quickly. We grow by the word. The word of God, brothers and sisters. <laughs> let me bring up my camera so I can show you. The, the Word of God, the Bible, this book here, well, my one don't look so hot to be on screen, but the Word of God contains the spiritual material that we need to grow. It provides the resources, the substance that gives sinew, that gives flesh to the bones. This is where all our and that's why the Bible refers to it as food. We live by the word of God. It is our sustenance. You know how you feel when you when you get hungry. You know how you feel when you don't eat for a couple of hours or you know or maybe a full day. Again, the, I would have to do a full presentation on it, but just take from me the word of God is your food. And how often do you need to eat to feel strong? You need to eat. Every day. Ellen G. White in the book Desire of Ages, page 219, says, The life of Christ that he gives, that gives life to the world, is in his word. It was by his word that Jesus healed diseases and cast out demons. By his word, he still the sea and raised the dead. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ, and the Savior desired to fix the fate of his followers on the word. When his visible presence should be withdrawn, the word must be their source of power. So I don't need to tell you, brothers and sisters, as believers, that you need to read the word. You need to study it diligently. You need to memorize it. And finally, you need to do what it says. Read the word. So much things to unpack there, but again, the time won't allow me. But it's there right in the, in the book. One of the things that we normally neglect 
in spiritual growth, interestingly, is the work of the Holy Spirit. We normally talk about Bible study, prayer, witnessing, and fellowship. But the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, is the one who gives us spiritual life and power. And the Holy Spirit has been given to the church. When the Apostle Paul met some believers and saw how they were behaving, he asked them the question in Acts chapter 19, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? And today, based on how some of us behave, brothers and sisters in the church, the pastors, we need to ask ourselves the question that the Apostle Paul asked, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? And based upon what the Bible teaches us, our attitude towards the Holy Spirit must be that we must receive him in our hearts. The Bible tells us that without the Holy Spirit, Spirit sorry, we are none of his. We need to listen to his voice. Jesus says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. We need to obey his voice. We need to not grieve the Holy Spirit. And we need to pray earnestly for his presence every day. Again, so much to unpack, but I'm just touching and going. We also grow through prayer. I told you that the word of God contains the spiritual resources that we need to grow. But prayer is the way we receive those resources. Prayer is the key. It is, it is the instrument in our hands that, that allows us to receive and to ask for and to claim those resources. Prayer. It helps us to partake of God's grace and power. Ellen White says it is a key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. And so we need to pray. I won't be able to go through these steps for effective prayer life, but it's important that you develop a habit of prayer. Let me tell you something. How I used to pray. You know, before I became a mature Christian, I can, and I can say by the grace of God, I'm, I, have, I have grown. I used to pray just to fulfill a duty to say, Lord, you see that I've, I've prayed, I've, I've, I've checked off, I've read my Bible, I have prayed. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When you grow to understand, as Pastor mentioned this morning, the danger that you're in every day through the work of the enemy. I don't pray anymore just to check off a spiritual duty. I pray because I cannot do without God. I pray because I need him. And I can't do without him. Amen? And then we need to, in order for us to grow, God is going to send trials and temptations our way. It is through trials and temptation. There are two things that trials do to us. Number one, it exposes where we are. It shows us where we are. Sometimes when we face trials, we say, boy, look out. I was such a good Christian until this thing happened. The truth is that, just like the Apostle Peter, when the cross experience came to him, all that that experience did was to expose his true spiritual condition. And when we, when, when we, are, when we see our true spiritual condition, secondly, the trials help us to claim and to ask for wisdom that we lack, according to the Apostle James. When we see the wisdom that we lack, when, when we face a little pressure and we begin to curse, we say, Lord, have mercy upon me. I didn't know that, that that thing was in my heart. Oh, Lord, get rid of it. I didn't know selfishness and pride was in my heart. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. So trial expose us, and it also helps us to claim the promise of God. The Bible referred to it as the fiery trial because like gold, when you put gold in fire, it can only get better. <laughs> it can only get more purified, and so is a Christian. We grow also through witnessing because when we receive God's word through prayer and through studying his word, we need to share it with others in order to grow also. Here is what witnessing does for us. Here is what witnessing does for us when we share God's word. Number one, it keeps us in tune with God's passion. Witnessing helps us to understand that God loves people. Amen? Amen. God is passionate about people. And when we see how passionate God is about people, then we recognize how God pa is passionate about us. Secondly, witnessing gives fuel and meaning to our prayer life. 
we cannot pray thy kingdom come unless we are working to bring God's kingdom. Witnessing help us to pray for other people and for their conversion. Many times our prayer life becomes dread, dread, dry and empty because we are not seeking the salvation of others. We are, we are praying selfish prayers, just me, me, me. But witnessing help us to be in tune with God's purpose and God's mission so we can grow. And, and finally, witnessing, it broadens our understanding of the Bible and deepens our capacity to know more. The more we empty by sharing with others, the more we want more. And that's why we're not going to grow. If we don't witness, we're going to become spiritual obese. We also grow through connection with others. In our lifetime, we will not be able to study everything we need to grow and every insight we need to, 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 to become mature. We are blessed to have the insight and experience of others to help us grow. So we need to connect with others. It's not an individualistic kind of thing where I read my Bible and pray and get to heaven by myself. No, we need to connect with others because God has invested others with wisdom that we need. When he called the Apostle Paul, Jesus spoke to Paul himself, but he sent Paul to Ananias and said, Ananias is going to tell you what to do. There are some of us who don't like to be told what to do by others. We feel we need to get our direction from God, but God told Paul, listen, go and Ananias will tell you what to do. We need fellowship to grow. Amen. Again, I won't be able to expand it because I have to have another section, another section I want to close off with. But just to close this section, I want you to know two things about spiritual growth. Number one, growth takes time. <laughs> you can't tell yourself we're going to grow 50 feet tomorrow morning. Jesus asked the question, can you add, can you by anxiety add one cubit to your statue? No, you have to wait in God's workshop and let him work on you. And secondly, you should not become discouraged by apparent failures because God has made a commitment to you that he which hath begun a good work in you, he will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. So don't become discouraged if you make mistakes. Go back into the workshop and let God continue his work in your life. The final thing I want to share with you before I close is I want to talk about why some people fail to grow why some persons fail to become spiritually mature i want to let you know my brothers and sisters that in the parable of the sower who went forth to sow found in matthew chapter 13 jesus spoke about the seeds that fell on different soil he mentioned four type of soil but if you notice something here only one soil experienced maturity. Only one soil experienced maturity. There were other soil that experienced growth. Follow me now. There are many soil that experience growth, but only one experienced maturity. Remember the, the story I told you the, when I started out on Monday about my experience of farming. That as young children, when we farm, when we, when we plant stuff and, we, and watch it grow, we never worry about bearing fruit. We just, we just love to watch plants grow and we, we are excited to see the things growing up. But we never reap anything. And I'm saying to you that we can't approach our spiritual life like that. And Jesus is saying that only one soil brought forth fruit. The others, they grew, but they never brought forth any fruit. What is it that hinders them from growing? There are two things Jesus mentioned that hinder those who grow. I'm not talking about the hardness, the one that fell by the wayside because they didn't, they didn't accept God's word. I'm speaking to these Christians now. I'm speaking to those of us who have accepted, who have received the word in our heart and are experiencing growth. But are we bearing fruit for the glory of God? There are two things that hinder maturity. Number one, Jesus says, is a lack of earth, lack of deepness of earth. And number two, 
are the thorns. Are we together? Lack of earth and thorns. Let me quickly explain them because time is going and I won't be able to go deep into them. The lack of earth, brothers and sisters, the lack of earth represents those who neglect a deeper experience. They come to Christ um, at one point and they, 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 they willingly follow him and accept him in their hearts. But for many years, for many years, all they have is that initial experience of following the Lord. They do not seek a deeper experience in Christ. And every time that testimony time come around, all they can tell you about is when they accept Jesus 20 years ago. But they do not have any new experience in Christ to tell you about. These, Jesus says, because they have no deepness of earth, when trials and temptation come, they are going to abandon the faith. And some even abandon the faith, but are still in the church. You're not with me. Some, let me repeat that, some even abandon the faith, but they still go to church. But they're not growing. And, you know, and anyway, White tells, the Bible tells us about what is it that caused this. Number one is a lack of devotional life. Ellen G. White says in the book, Messages of Young People, says, Neglect the exercise of prayer or engage in prayer spasmodically. No one then has seemed convenient. And you lose your hold on God. The spiritual faculties lose their vitality. The religious experience lacks health and vigor. Another thing that prevents the deepness of experience is spiritual laziness. When we are satisfied with a, with a mere appearance of godliness, but we do not seek a deeper experience in Christ. Then you talk about lack of nurturing. As a church, those who come to Christ can fail to grow because, they, because we as spiritual leaders didn't take time to nurture them as they should. In this book, we can keep them if we care, James Crest quotes Keith Bailey in saying, The condition of prolonged spiritual infancy is in most cases the result of poor discipleship or of no discipleship at all. He says, Converts are no more able to care for themselves than babies are able to care for themselves. Neglect of the new convert at this stage tends to make him a spiritual dropout or it locks him into permanent babyhood. <laughs> permanent babyhood so if we don't nurture new believers when persons get baptized and come into the church we have a responsibility to nurture them so that they can grow in grace another thing that that um prevents a lack of prevents strong spiritual growth and a deep experience is an unwillingness to endure trials sometimes when we face hardship that god himself appoints for us we throw off our faith and we, we neglect to endure the trial of our faith. And in the book, Early Writings, anybody spoke about that. If we neglect the trial of our faith, we are going to be spewed out of God's mouth. So those are the things that cause a lack of earth, a lack of deep experience in Christ. Finally, I turn to the thorns. So we're talking about things that prevent us from becoming mature. The first one is a lack of deep depth. A lack of deepness. The second one is thorns. Let me explain this one. You see, when we talk about um, lack of earth, the one who neglects to, 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 to be grounded does, fails because of a lack of growth. But the one with the thorns fail not because they don't grow, but because they allow other things in their lives to grow other than the grace of God. These are represented by the thorns that, that are in our lives. The Bible tells us, it says, He that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of the word, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So this is representing a Christian experience that is duplex. You love God with all your heart, but not really. 
there are some other things that you love equal to God and, and that creates a problem. It represents cherished sins and, and other things in our lives, a love of this world that we allow to come in and crowd out the word of God. Acts of the Apostles, page 532 says, Sad indeed is the condition of those who becoming weary of the way, allow the enemy of souls to rob them of the Christian graces that have been developing in their hearts. When we love Jesus, oh, here it is. Here it is, the, 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 the list of things that, 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 that are represented as thorns. Number one is cherished sins. Those darling idols that we won't let go of. Those practices that we fail to abandon. They will grow up like thorns and choke the word. Then you talk about equally absorbing interests. The love of money. The love of prestige. We have to pursue these things and... And the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 said the love of money is the root of all evil while some, while some committed after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It means that they have not surrendered everything to God completely. And finally, thorns represent failure to maintain, one, maintain one's vigilance and to keep up the battle against sin. Because my brothers and sisters, we still live in the flesh. <laughs> and so even though we are alive to Christ, we still live in the flesh. And based upon the Apostle Paul's argument in, in the book of Romans, he says that we have no more obligation to the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. I want to end this presentation this point, brother and sister, by telling you an experience that helped me to understand what it means to hold on to Jesus. Because in the end of all that I've said. Of all that I've said my brothers and sisters. The greatest thing that hinders spiritual growth is distraction. When we get distracted and divert our attention to other things. I was living in the Bay Islands of Honduras. And it's a small island that is off the mainland. And there are two ways you can get to the mainland. One, you can take a boat, or they call it a ferry, and the other is a plane. The first time I was going on the mainland, I, I, I chose to go on the ferry. And when I was going in, paid my ticket and was going in, inside, a young lady was giving me a paper bag. And I said, I don't want any paper bag. And I didn't take it. But when I got into the middle of the journey, the first time I've ever gone out so far in, in the sea, first time on a ship or a boat or anything like that, I began to get seasick. And now I realized why I needed the paper bag. But I held it out for the one hour journey and I didn't, I didn't throw up. When I was coming back, I told a friend who I met, a gentleman from Canada, and I was talking to him about the experience. And he said, listen, I know the problem. He says... What caused you to upset is the movement of your eyes because the thing is, the, 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 the ferry is going up and down based on the wind. And so your eyes moving up and down and causing it to become sick. But if you can get your eyes to be steady, you will feel better. And he says the way to do that is to find the horizon and fix your eyes on it because the horizon doesn't move. The horizon is right, always there. And I tried it, brethren, and it worked. I keep my eyes on the horizon and I never feel sick. But guess what? Sometimes in the middle of the journey, when I get caught up in conversations, I forget, I forgot that I needed to keep my eyes on the horizon. And as, as soon as I remember, I, just, I fix my eyes on it again. And from that day, I learned a very valuable spiritual lesson. In this world, my brother, in this Christian journey, my brothers and sisters, our number one job is to fix our eyes upon Jesus. He's the only constant in this world. But sometimes, amidst the, the bustle and bustle of life, we neglect to keep our eyes on Jesus. Sometimes because of, of, of ungodly music or ungodly movies or ungodly conversations, Sometimes because of our, our desire for wealth and for, 
and for those things. We forget to keep our eyes on Jesus. And we get distracted. I'm telling you, my brother and sister, take it from me. Our number one problem is distraction. It's not that we don't know what to do. All that I told you just now, you know. You know you need to read the Bible. You know you need to pray. You know you need to go to church. You know you need to ask for the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we get distracted. And our attention is diverted to other things. And we neglect to bring back our attention. And so one of the greatest duties we're going to have as a Christian is to guard the avenues of the soul. This mind here, you, have a, you, you must be like a watchman who makes certain that Jesus is the only one who sits on the throne. I was here in my, writing my study here yesterday and some folks next door are playing some music, some ungodly music, I mean some, some worldly music and subconsciously I found myself just nodding. But then I said, well, are we, what kind of music that? Music that I used to listen to in the past, but then I have to bring back myself and say, no, be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask you to stay. We need to have the word of God in our minds and in our hearts to guard us and to keep us on course, brothers and sisters. So as I wrap this up, as I close, we know what to do. We know that we need to pray. We know we need to read our Bibles. But we sometimes allow things to distract us, whether the thorns that we allow to grow or the neglect of spiritual life that causes us to lose our hold and our connection with God. May God help us, brothers and sisters, that by his grace, we will stay in our worship, in his worship. God is not finished with us yet. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he who has begun a good work in you will continue it even unto the day of Jesus Christ. God bless you. If it is your desire, my brothers and sisters, to remain in that workshop, just say, I will stay. Say something that tells me that you want to stay with God. You're not going to leave him until he is done perfecting his work in your life. And I'll pray for you just now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Oh God, help us not to allow the thorns nor the lack of experience to cause us to not become mature Christians. But help us like that good grown hero God to receive the word in a good and understanding heart. And with patience, let us bring fruit to maturity. For the glory of the name of Jesus who have called us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.